uh, in biostatistics in the Arnold School of Public Health at the University of South Carolina. Dr. Blair is a fellow in the American College of Epidemiology, uh, the Society for Behavioral Medicine, the American College of Sports Medicine, the American Heart Association, as well as the American Kinesiology Academy. He has held many different important leadership positions, which include serving as past president of the American College of Sports Medicine, the National Coalition for Promoting Physical Activity, and the American Kinesiology Academy. His research focuses on the associations between lifestyle and health with a specific emphasis on exercise, physical fitness, body composition, and chronic disease. He is truly a prolific scientist. Um, he has published more than 700 papers and chapters in the scientific literature. for the U.S. Surgeon General's report on physical activity and health. So we're very pleased to have such a, a renowned scholar of Dr. Blair's caliber to join us today and serve as our keynote speaker for the 2016 Carl Blythe Lecture in Exercise and Sports Science. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Blair. <laughs> Thank you very much for that very nice introduction. And congratulations to Leslie, is it? Yes. Yeah, my niece has that name too. So, and she's also very capable, and very smart, and in fact has a PhD from this institution. So keep on going. <laughs> but again, certainly um, it, it, it's a pleasure to be here, to come back to Chapel Hill. It's uh, been a few years since, since I was here. Uh, there is a very famous epidemiologist named Dr. Blair, who has his MPH from here. And that would be little brother Aaron, less than his dad, but not, not me, no, not me. But so we used to come regularly when, uh, when Aaron's family was here. It's really nice to come back and see this wonderful place. So uh, here are my disclosures. Uh, certainly I feel very honored uh, to deliver, to be selected to deliver uh, this lecture. And as, again, as you can see here, uh, uh, Dr. Blythe, uh, uh, we overlapped a bit. I was at South Carolina from 66 to 84, and I think you said that's when Dr. Hyatt came here. So he and I came uh, the same year to this part of the world. Uh, but I did meet Dr. Blythe a few times, and I had forgotten that he was the founding editor of MSSE. And it could be the reason I forgot that. He probably rejected a bunch of my papers. <laughs> <laughs> He was tough and a good scientist, and uh, I know of some of the interactions. I mean, I didn't work closely with him, but his work on fluid replacement, heat, heat injury, and things of that sort uh, influenced some of my early research. So, again, very pleased to be here. Now, does anyone here know that there's a epidemic of obesity? <laughs> Have you ever heard about that? Uh, well, I didn't put up the U.S. slides here, the European slides. And you can see over time the darker, redder colors in a higher percentage of the population is obese. Okay, we have an epidemic of obesity around the world. What's causing it? Well, if you go to the, uh, who was I talking to about uh, Sir Isaac, uh, Aaron Owen, and basic science, energy balance. Uh, if you take in more calories than you burn, Something has to happen to that energy, and it tends to get stored as fat. So we're having increase in obesity. That means more people are in a positive caloric balance on more days. So again, simple model, positive caloric, ba or caloric balance, calories in, equaling calories out, the weight's going to stay the same. Now, OK, I know, I know we've got some very uh, basic physiologists here in the room, and I know it's much more complicated in that last slide. And if any of you uh, ask me detailed questions about some of these mechanisms, et cetera, et cetera, I will be totally offended because I'll have to say, God, I don't know anything about that. <laughs> so uh, maybe, maybe you need to talk to one of the physiologists. But it is, of course, quite complex. 
But uh, some of the, the associations of clean energy balance and factors affecting it actually go back 60 years. Uh, Jean Mayer published this seminal paper in 1956. And I'll show a little more data on this uh, in a moment. But these are from uh, workers in India. And what he found showing here, uh, body weight, and this is what we're now calling at least the threshold. And this is energy intake. Well, look how much these guys were eating. Yeah, but they weren't gaining weight. They were in energy balance. But when you get below some level, which, and my favorite term now is the unregulated zone or uh, below the, uh, the regulation, uh, it's much more difficult for most of us to match our intake to our expenditure. Now, there are exceptions. Uh, I'm, I'm really not a Blair. I think I'm actually a Kindenhall, a Mendenhall, or a King, or a Fisher, because the Blairs are tall and skinny. <laughs> like my Aunt Jean. She died recently at 90-something. Tall and skinny. Never saw her do any exercise. She wasn't interested in being active. And I never heard her turn down a second piece of pumpkin pie. At Thanksgiving, she's skinny. And I am very sad that she died because I know where she is now. She's in hell because she lived her life in paradise, so now she's got to pay back. And she's just in the house. I don't know what she did. So I think that says, Where am I going? I've been battling this stuff. You can see I'm not called skinny. I've been battling weight for decades and fight it uh, every day. So that's a complex issue. And it is not well understood. And we need, one of the reasons that I select this as a topic and research we've been doing for the last uh, several years, we need to learn more about energy balance. And I would like to see more balance in the discussion of energy balance or obesity. Now here, just uh, this week, Google search. Look, you put in this term, oh God, physical activity and obesity, half a million hits. Yeah, but when you put diet and obesity, look at that. And we published some data like this in a, a medical journal editorial a few years ago. And I said, let's put in something like this. And, and we did. And one of the reviewers, is one of you smart guys here, gals here, the reviewer wrote, I said, well, that's Google. Who cares about Google? So that's when we went to PubMed and looked at the difference in PubMed. So it's both in the popular media and in the scientific media, huge, huge, huge overemphasis on diet and obesity. So, okay, what's causing it? Well, Americans are eating more, right? Yes, we're eating more. Pop quiz, eating more than we did decades ago. I know I've made you suspicious. <laughs> Either are we eating more? You have to put up your right hand if you think we're eating more. Left hand if you think we're eating less. And if you don't vote, you get an F. <laughs> okay. Okay, some of you are humoring me. <laughs> so we go to the best data that we have, and I think there are probably some nutritionists here who might well certainly offend and will understand maybe who may be uh, early. But if we go to uh, the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, have been done repeatedly in big representative. Uh, samples of, of American adults showing here data from these four uh, different uh, NHANES surveys, and we've spent tens of millions of dollars measuring diet in NHANES. So look at this trends in energy intake, as published uh, over a decade ago in the Morbidity Mortality Weekly Report. And look at this in those first two NHANES surveys, these are the data for women, caloric intake. And then look at that increase in all age groups. I didn't put it in the main slide, but it's the same. So what happened when this report came out, I happened to have a friend, uh, a Van, who was uh, visiting us in Dallas and staying with us. And him, Van, what do you think of this uh, report here? He said, you can't call them trends. Well, why not? So here's what he told me. Those first two surveys, the 24-hour dietary recalls, were five days old. And then they went to seven days a week. Now, I know it would never happen to anyone in this room that on the weekend, you might eat or drink more than you did during the week. <laughs> so, okay. 
But probably the more important change that he and others later explained to me was they did more training of the inhanes dietary interviewers. Uh, taught them more about probing. So in fact, I can do an example. Uh, so uh, we'll do a 24 hour recall here on Leslie. Or I did it earlier today. I said, well, Leslie, what time did you get up yesterday? She said, oh, about 11.30, I think my usual time. <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, did you have any breakfast? Yes, I had some cornflakes and coffee. Okay, in those first two surveys, I would have said, well, then, did you have a snack later? Did you have lunch and so forth? But now I've been probed, I've talked to probe, and I say, well, Leslie, did you put anything on your cornflakes? Well, a cup of heavy cream and six teaspoons of sugar. <laughs> <laughs> or about coffee, cream, sugar. So you get the point. The more you probe, the more you find that people like. And that's probably the major difference in this change in these two periods. And by the way, who is this van guy that you like so much and think he's right? Well, this would be a Rear Admiral Dr. Van Hubbard, who's the director, or at least was then, of the National Institutes of Health and Nutrition Center. So this is not some stupid physical activity epidemiologist. This is the guy, and this is what he said, so, and I believe him. <laughs> so a couple years ago, we did uh, some research on the additional research on the NHANES dietary data, and Archer's my PhD student. So we uh, take the reported energy intake from in Haynes, and then you, know, you can use standard equations based on you know, whatever age, height, weight, so forth, and estimate their basal metabolic rate, and then divide the reported energy intake by their basal metabolic rate, and that gives what most of us in physical activity would call a physical activity level. So if you're at uh, 1.5, that means over 24 hours, your average energy expenditure is one and a half times your basal rate. And uh, a sedentary population, plenty of data on this, uh, the sedentary population, the average is about, about one and a half. So the results from the NHANES data, and we, we said in the article, you're going to agree, agree or disagree, that implausible values are less than 135 or more than 240, 2.4. Now, sure, there are some Tour de France people there are, yeah, they're, they're about 2.4, but in general, these are kind of the plausible range. So you'll note that the average values in these four groups, none of them were in the plausible range. And in fact, a huge percentage were just, they can't be believed. They cannot be right. And in fact, this one in particular, you know, <laughs> to a small degree. So then when we published this and we got enormous criticism from my nutrition, uh, colleagues, the school, and others. Well, yeah, that's we know that 24-hour dietary recalls are flawed, and you know there's a problem with them. So then I said, well, what else do we have? Well, we got laugh up, laugh, laugh up. No, it's loss-adjusted food availability in the U.S. Department of Agri Agriculture. You know how much food is present on January one, how much is imported, exported, etc. How much is left December third. So, how much food did we lose? From the environment. So that's calculating the, uh, the, the total energy supply. So what again Ed did was uh, take total energy expenditure as estimated from the Institute of Medicine, W labeled water equations, total energy expenditure data, and then looked at the LAFA uh, data to see well, does what people needed to be expending based on their energy expenditure, how does that compare to their energy intake? Well, here are the LAFA data, well, and the uh, energy expenditure data. And of course, this, I would say, went up because we got bigger. Elephants need more calories a day than mice. So anyone who talks about calories per day as a requirement isn't getting the picture. It should be calories per kilogram per day, whether it's intake or expenditure. But anyway, this is what was calculated from the double energy, or double, double level water energy expenditure. And this is the data from LAFA. So in this, this first period, the average American lost about 30 kilograms. And in this period, the average American gained about 98 kilograms. <laughs> no, <laughs> we're having trouble getting this published because stupid Ed keeps sending it to some nutrition 
journal and they send us nutrition <laughs> professors that out as much nonsense. But you know, my point is we have lousy data on nutrition intake in Americans and other countries as well. So again, that's what I just said. Now, to be clear, I'll bet I eat more servings of fruit and vegetables than just about anybody in this room. I believe in fruit and vegetables. I believe in whole grains, not so many. I try to eat a healthful diet. I do still have trouble with energy balance. Or professor's job. But uh, I do, I support. We need nutrition departments and professors and experts in promoting healthy diets. But to go on about just the nonsense and confusion that's out there on this obesity issue, okay, it's pop quiz time. Get ready. All of you are familiar with uh, the body mass index, of course, and the categories of the body mass index. So of these silhouettes of 10 men, which one do you think meets the overweight, the BMI overweight category? Well, you all got an F. Nobody <laughs> voted. Come on, shout it out. Which, which? E. D. G. E. D. E. D. Which one is obese? F. Okay, women. Which woman is overweight? E. D. D. Some of you have seen my lecture before. <laughs> Here are the answers. D is the correct answer. I've never had so many people say D. I've spoken at big international meetings, top notch. So some of you have heard me give this lecture before. <laughs> Either that or you are extremely smart. Which, which one should we go with? But really, look at that guy. Is he overweight? Is this guy obese? Okay, this guy's obese. No question. So is he. And go to the women. She's overweight. Well, she's not going to be a supermodel, but uh, <laughs> and this woman is obese. These are the BMI categories. So I think there's a lot of nonsense about those categories. They shouldn't have been changed in 1998. That was, in my opinion, a political change, I think, driven by the big pharma. I have no proof, but that's my uh, belief. So these categories and BMI are essentially useless, certainly for clinical work. I think for surveillance and big populations, okay, that's fine. But there are some problems with BMI. And some of you may know Catherine Flegel, uh, you know, actually overweight is good for you. She published this several years ago from again the big national uh, database. I think this is from Ann Haynes, I don't have it up here. So the underweight, they were more likely to die, 33,000 more deaths. Well, most people would say, yeah, but that's, those underweight people are sarcopenic, they, they've got cancer, they've got disease, and I can buy that's probably the explanation for this. Uh, could be eating disorders and the like. Overweight in the United States, according to Catherine's calculations, 86,000 fewer deaths compared to the reference category of normal. 86,000 fewer deaths. So some of you skin people Maybe you better start putting on some pounds and get here in this overweight category. Class one obesity, okay, 30,000 more deaths, although not statistically significant. But then we're just bombarded all the time. We need more careful science. And again, back to the crazy, crazy statements that I've already said, popular media, uh, scientific journals. Uh, here's, the, here's one. It's all about people eating too much. And in science, the journal Science, one of the leading journals, scientific journals in the world, and these very prominent guys, he was, he was the editor at that time, president of Stanford, he was, what was he, secretary of something or other, I forget. I'm sure they're both members of the Institute, or the American Academy of Science. So they published this article over a decade ago, on the obesity epidemic. And look at this. Oh. Okay, what's anything wrong with that statement? Well, if they're eating twice the daily requirement, 
That means we're eating 1,900 extra calories a day. And I know this is the right answer because my eight-year-old granddaughter calculated it for me. I know she'd be right on it. 1,800 extra calories a day. And I know there's some flexibility and variability, but in general, if you're in positive energy balance for 7,700 calories, you're going to lay down a kilogram of fat. So the average American has been laying down one kilogram of fat every four days for 90 kilograms a year. This is utter nonsense in an editorial in science. Yes, I can get you educated. And then you know, after that in England, British Science Festival, top scientists in England gathering for a meeting and a reporter in the Daily Telegraph interviewed of a, a chair of one of the top centers in England. And here at least is what the guy reported. Maybe the scientist didn't say this. But this is what the reporter said, the scientist said, was the caloric intake in England in 1980. What? <laughs> what? And now it's this amount. And there's been no change in energy expenditure. Well, if this guy is right, the average Brit now weighs seven and a half tons. <laughs> it's just beyond me. Now, first of all, a scientist can say things like this, and how it gets a science reporter and gets published. Now, here's one that's more recent, came out just a few months ago, last summer. Obesity rates up and up and up, and it's all about eating too much. You know, it's we're not uh, uh, we're not being more physically active. I'm going to come back to that a little later. Uh, has there really been no change in energy expenditure in American life over the last 50 years? No change? What about some of these categories? Now, if you look at the Ed Haynes data on self-reported leisure time physical activity, we walk, run, swim, play tennis, et cetera, those numbers have been pretty flat. Those percent pretty flat. That's one relatively small component of a person's total daily energy expenditure. Even that, uh, who's that crazy guy who just went for a run right before this? Did, did he, did he, where are you? Yeah, there he is. He did get his shower and, and he's back. Uh, so, uh, yes, but uh, why did I go off and pick on Claudio? Uh, I don't know. But okay, there are other components of energy expenditure. The biggest share of energy expenditure is resting metabolic rate. Now here's some other examples. So Tim Church led an effort to publish this five years ago. Now, are there any labor experts in the room? But every one of you could have drawn a figure very close to this, couldn't you? Over the last 50 years, service jobs, sitting on your bottom jobs, up and up and up. Mining and manufacturing falling in hand. Agriculture, only it's good. Now, I have been bragging to some of you that I'm really smart. Because back here, about 1955, growing up a poor farm boy in Kansas, working my tail off every day, all that heavy, heavy work, no one in my family had ever gone to college. I said, I'm going to go to college. And Grandpa said, yes, Steve, you can get yourself an education. And you could get a job in out of the weather. And you'd be any better than that. In out of the weather and sitting on your bottom from the computer. But anyway, <laughs> these chain, this slide is no surprise to anyone. So what Tim did was assign energy expenditure values, average energy expenditure values, using the uh, compendium of our and group, uh, to assign energy expenditure values to these different kinds of jobs. And a brilliant mathematician, Donna Thomas, uh, not a public health, but just a math statistician. Uh, she calculated, oh, wait a minute, before I get to that, I just said I grew up on the farm. <laughs> I do know how to work. So visiting our friends, Ilka and Ava over in Finland a couple of years ago, I said, well, you want to go to sauna? We need some wood down in the sauna. Hey, I know how to do that. Saw it, split it, put it in this wheelbarrow right there, haul it down to sauna, get that done, say, okay, now is there anything else I need to do before we can go to sauna. So I go see, see Tadioka, my supervisor. 
<laughs> so you department chairs and deans, uh, you know this is probably the way you spend most of your time. <laughs> so Diana came up with these calculations over this 50 year period. Occupational energy expenditure in the average American man and the average American woman is down, down that amount. Now again, if you don't deal with something, you have what's 120 calories, well, who cares about that? Well, if you know that the obesity epidemic experts say that the obesity epidemic can be explained by a positive caloric balance of 70 to 90 calories a day. And that's day after day after day after day. And the same with this, <coughs> day after day after day, 140 fewer calories. So then uh, Tim said to uh, Diana, well, here's the average weight of American women in 1962. Calculate for me using your formula, the, your estimated weight of women for these time points. And again, she's not a public health person. She probably never heard of N. Haynes at that point. But Tim, of course, picked the dates of N. Haynes where there were measured weights. And look at how closely her prediction from the estimated decline in occupation. In the men, it's even tighter. I think the R squared here was for men and women is about 0.92. How many R squares do you find in your research? 0.9? <laughs> Not many. So this is a big. So I said to Tim, well, that's great. There are other components of energy expenditure. He said, no, I'm too busy. Why don't you do it? So again, I had this bright PhD student named Ed. So Ed, let's look at household management energy expenditure. So we collected data from big databases over 45 year period. Household management, cooking, cleaning, childcare, et cetera, in American women. And note that over this period, that declined 1,800 calories a week. 1,800 calories a week. Now we were very careful writing this article to not be critical uh, of women. That's what some of my female colleagues really attack me. So now you're just saying women are fat, lazy slobs, and if all they did was more housework, they wouldn't be overweight. We didn't say that at all. Oh, also another component. What do you think happened to screen time over this period? Yes, up and up and up and up. Surprise, surprise. More American women in positive energy balance because of these changes. <laughs> and one other uh, the domain that I'll mention is getting to work. Now, this is a brilliant audience at a wonderful university. In fact, the, the second best university in the Carolinas. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> and I have lots of bicycles and so on and so forth. But again, nationally, Look at what's happened over these 40 years. Uh, more people driving to work, parking as close as they can instead of walking public transit by. And these things are changing. What about elementary schools? You go to an elementary school, you see a line of cars waiting. They don't just drop the kid off on the corner. They wait in line until the car gets right up to the door so the kid doesn't have to walk very far. There were some people in England a couple of years ago who wanted to call that child abuse and take those people and make an answer for them. But that's not the way I went to elementary school, I'll tell you that. Pat took me to elementary school. A pony. And if you look at the data, riding a pony is about equivalent to a brisk walk. So I had to ride him a mile and a half, but it was like walking. <laughs> okay, if it was really nasty, really rainy, daddy might drive me that day. Like this. Anyway, we've engineered energy expenditure down and down and down. And anyone who says, no, we're still expending the average person the same amount as we did 50 years ago, I think you must be a complete nitwit. <laughs> and if you, if you have data to prove that's the case, Get it public, show it to them, then maybe I'll change my opinion. We're engineering energy expenditure out of line. I didn't put it in the slides, but I've got a slide of a battery driven can opener and a battery driven fork. So if you like spaghetti, you stick your fork in it, punch the button, and it spins around. <laughs> Let's save that unit now. 
Now you remember I posted my disclosures. I've had a good research support in recent years from the Coca-Cola company. So if you think I'm totally biased, that's your privilege. But how much is sugar attacked as the cause of all the world's problems? So again, we certainly did it. I've done this several times. But this time I got a graduate student to do it, so I'm sure it's right. <laughs> Searching Google. Sugar is bad, poison, harmful, bad for you, bad for your health. Mm. Tobacco. A lot fewer hits on every category. And I didn't ask uh, Madison to do it, but the last time I did this, you put in heroin, cocaine, marijuana, you get exactly this. Well, not exactly, but you get the same pattern. Sugar is worse than cocaine, heroin, tobacco, marijuana, and maybe anything else you can make. Well, this is this is where we are with what the public is bombarded with. But then, unfortunately, where we do actually have some data, in Australia several years ago, obesity rates triple in Australia. Sugar intake went down during that same period. How did that happen? Oh my goodness. Must have been that Australian son or something. Oh, England, obesity rates more than doubled, sugar intake declined. Okay, what about the US? We did have a huge increase in sugar intake in the United States. It was before any of your, well, maybe everybody except one or two of us were born back in the 1920s and 30s. Sugar intake did that. But to hear recently, uh, again from the National Center for Health Statistics, uh, no chatter, sugar, you know, it's carbohydrate, you know, the data on the sugar is saying sugar intake isn't increasing. So let me tell you, sugar in, in, increases in sugar intake are not the cause of the Mexican drug cartel or ISIS or something else, or Donald Trump. <laughs> Well, I don't know, maybe, maybe it is. And again, uh, as I mentioned this uh, editorial from last summer briefly, this is one of the quotes from the editorial. Look at that big cross-sectional econometric analysis. Worldwide, look at this, for every 150 calories, an 11-fold increase. Oh my God, Steve, you must be wrong. Sugar is causing diabetes, 11 full higher rates. But then of course, what Mel Ultra didn't take into account was that maybe I would go to the actual article that he referenced here and find this figure. Does that look like 11 fold increase? I think it may have been significant. I guarantee you they didn't adjust for activity or fitness. So, don't just fall for every next wild headline you see or something you hear on Fox. No, no, wait a minute. No one here would watch Fox News, right? <laughs> nice liberal audience. <laughs> so we need to develop a better understanding of energy balance. So why are we gaining weight that I've been ranting on about? Eating too much, drinking a little boat, et cetera. So there's this energy balance study that was started by some absolutely brilliant professors at the Carolina. <laughs> okay, we started this uh, several years ago. And our goal was to measure expenditure and intake as well as you can in free living individuals. So we used the body media armband, which uh, I think at that time at least was the best device to measure total energy. Where uh, on the upper arm, it's got all kinds of sensors you can't see these, but triaxial accelerometer, heat flux, skin temperature, uh, galvanic skin response, and it correlates with double labeled water energy expenditure about 0.92. So but in a, it's better than double labeled water because you can look at intensities, bouts of activity, etc. So this great device for measuring energy expenditure. We asked them to wear it uh, 10 days to two weeks. And uh, during that same period, one of my colleagues, a famous uh, nutrition scientist, still speaks to me, kind of strange, but uh, uh, he has a big center uh, where they've done hundreds of thousands of 24-hour dietary recalls. So the 430 
young adults in this study, we gave them training on portion size. We gave them a chart they could take home, look at this portion size. So when the dietitian calls you and asks you what they ate, what you ate, how much, and so forth. And then uh, his group did three random recalls, one weekend day, uh, during the period they were wearing the, the armband. And I do have to say, Amanda, the armband lady, my PhD student, we want them to wear these armbands 24 hours a day, except when in water. And poor Amanda, she did a lousy job at adherence. She only got, I think, 8.5 days at 23.4 hours of wear. So we knew what the heck they were doing over the entire seven, eight days, 10 days, and what have you. We knew their energy expenditure. A lot of other measures. And I was cute people. Have any of you heard about DEXA? How many of those machines did I see today on the great tour of the lab? All these measures, and at one, uh, one year we actually changed this to two years, 200 people getting the upper day with water. Repeating these measures quarterly. So what happens to these young adults over time? Changes in this, changes in that, what happens to their weight and their body composition? So back to Jean Mayer study showing it just a little bit differently. There's a little more data. These Indian workers, sedentary, you know, clerks not doing any light work. And it's very heavy work, I think, from the article. These are guys carrying 100 kilogram bales of cotton or something, really working hard. So uh, again, their uh, caloric intake, yeah, if they were going to stay alive and keep their body alive, they had to eat a lot more and more and more. And their weights, of course, stayed, the weights were the same. So from one of the early calculations in from our energy balance data, I uh, just uh, got this the other day. It was published uh, last year. Well, I just got the slide from one of my junior colleagues. But this uh, body weight across physical activity groups, this kind of looks like my A's graphs. So we thought, okay, it looks like maybe things haven't changed much in 60 years. Uh, then uh, more, more data. Uh, this is, uh, pretty, I think, still in review. Uh, so 195 people have measures at two years, measured every quarter, remember, objective data, uh, and so forth, and weight and percent fat and so forth. So in this analysis, 55% had no change or change less than 5%. Weight losers lost more than 5%. Weight gainers gained more than 5%. And here are the results from that. I apologize, kind of a complicated slide. Uh, but this is the sedentary minutes. This is the light physical activity minutes, less than three minutes. This is the moderate to vigorous total minutes of physical activity. And this is the moderate to vigorous bouts of 10 minutes, no, number of 10 minute bouts, I think, or number of minutes in 10 minute bouts, something like that. So you can see the weight gainers, yeah, their expenditure down. Not much change, not a little change there. Those who were in weight maintenance over this two year period, they stayed kind of about the same. Those who lost weight, reduced their sedentary and light time, and guess what? Increased their moderate to vigorous activity. So they shifted their energy balance into a negative energy balance Energy had to come from somewhere, so it came from the fat stored in their bodies. We've got a number of papers in progress and review. And stay tuned to this. I've said that when I talk about energy balance, I've briefly described it. I say there's no database like this in the world. And I've said this now in lots of meetings, in probably dozens of countries, no one's ever attacked me. So I'm actually beginning to believe I might be right. It's a really unique database with all these measures every quarter, percent of fat, et cetera, et cetera. So stay tuned. And if you PhD students you might want to work on a topic like this, oh, you can maybe contact me about working on the database. And I get to be first author. <laughs> no, I don't care. I don't want anything. Uh, we need to develop a better understanding. And I think uh, you mentioned in the introduction the fitness fatness notion. I've been, we published our first paper on this in 1995, I think, and I've been vigorously attacked for years and years about this crazy idea that fitness is more important than fatness 
as it relates to health outcomes. And I say to these critics, well, if you think I'm wrong, do a proper study, collect good data, measure fitness, measure fatness, measure health outcomes, get death certificates, and do analyses and publish a paper showing I'm wrong. Well, 20 years and they haven't done it. They still are nasty to me at how crazy this is. But for example, Mayor Mace, who published this a few years ago, and what I used to call the prime of life, I'm going to make her redo this because this is now 75 and older, is the prime of life. But then I'm going to be by with 60. So these uh, men and women, several thousand of them, I forget, many of them. Uh, Paul had a maximal exercise test on a treadmill, and they were sorted into fifths of cardiorespiratory fitness in that exercise test. Note that we also had percent body fat on these thousands of people, measured in the laboratory. Percent fat. Whoops. Why did that happen? Did you do something? No. <laughs> <laughs> So look at this across fifths of fitness. Here are the risk of dying with the low fit, lowest fit group, the highest risk. Get out of that bottom fit group and cut your risk of dying in half. A little further benefits. You get on out, even out here, uh, some, some further benefit. But look at this summary data. These are the fit ones. Now that means they were at least moderately fit, which means they were not in the bottom one fifth. It doesn't mean they were marathon runners. There were a few marathon runners in the group, but they were not in the bottom one fifth. And these are the normal fat, in fat measured in the lab, and these are the obese. I think we used 25% for men, 35% for women, or something like that. And these are the death rates. Doesn't look like obesity has anything to do with risk of dying. You look at the unfit, say it's the fitness that's important. And how do you get to be fit? Exercise. exercise. Get out there and do your exercise. Keep up your exercise. So how should we deal with this obesity epidemic? Well, obviously, I think we, well, I think I perfectly understand the energy balance issues. But maybe we should do some more research and really sort out energy balance. And let's design some interventions. All kinds of interventions. I mean, there's the public policy that Mayor Bloomberg tried to do, you know, tax codes, uh, the policy of taking vending machines out of schools. I'm not opposed to doing those things if we actually do some research and show that they have an effect on anything of importance. No, doesn't exist. Uh, but in all these different areas, and in my current uh, passion, again, I don't do any real work, but I work with smart people who do. Uh, oh, I, I left my phone down in my backpack, but uh, you have. Up here in North Carolina, you have smartphones? Okay. <laughs> Let's learn how to use modern technology to communicate health behavior strategies and practices to help people not smoke, not have unprotected sex, not drink too much, be active, eat a healthy diet. Let's use modern technology because there'll never be enough nutritionists, exercise scientists, behavioral scientists to counsel everybody who needs it. So let's learn how to, and we have a nice $6 million center at South Carolina. And again, thank God, the guy who got the center doesn't have to head it. So, uh, and we've got a brilliant, uh, some of you may know Delia uh, West, a brilliant psychiatrist, a uh, psychologist. So let's design interventions using the, and test them. And then let's imp implement the ones that are successful. And if my idea is successful, okay, we won't implement it. If you need a better strategy, let's try, whoops, got a typo or two there. Uh, I think at the moment we can say, let's just try to help more people meet the guidelines. 150 minutes of moderate, you often recite these guidelines, or 75 minutes of vigorous, or mix and match, etc. eating your fruits and vegetables. If everybody in the United States did just this, the obesity epidemic would stop. That's my belief. Now give me, well, yes, of course, 
when Hillary appoints me as the grand poobah of everything, <laughs> this is what we're going to do. See? It's going to be mandatory. Anyway, we do have to help people learn how to use cognitive and behavioral strategies to make changes in health behaviors. So, and I know I've talked to some of you here today about that. This is why don't we have a K through 12 curriculum on behavioral science so the kids learn how to manage their behavior? The National Academy of Sciences a couple of years ago released a big document, Science Education in the United States. So I had to go to it, go to the find box and type in behavioral science and one half a nanosecond later, term not found. I'm not opposed to physics and chemistry and biology. And no, of course not. Are you telling me that we should have nothing, nothing in our educational system to help people learn how to manage their behavior? And the behavioral scientists have been working hard on this for the last two or three decades, and there's some good things out there. I don't care whether exercise is my interest, but does your dentist tell you to floss every day? Do you do it? Oh, she does. Do you do it every day? Not every day. Not every day. Okay, how often? Let's not. <laughs> so let's monitor and then let's help this guy learn how to do what she's doing. <laughs> so, of course, what do you expect a professor to say? And I expect a standing ovation for this. More support for physical activity. You go to the NIH website, and again, I did this, probably need to update it, uh, but uh, they've got categories and how much money is spent each category. So in fiscal year 23, I again, need to update this. Here they look at this, $2.4 billion on nutrition and obesity. I thought, well, good. Out of the 233 categories, I wonder how many or how much there uh, how many categories are there on exercise, fitness, that's kind of None. None. Now, I'm not saying NIH spend no money. I've been fortunate to have tens of millions of dollars from NIH, and Russ Bay has probably twice that amount. So, sure, but it's not, an, it's not even an important enough topic that they would list it out of 233 categories. I mean, I'm, sure, anorexia would be a terrible problem to have. And I have a colleague who has a kid with anorexia. Sure, let's do research. But anorexia isn't as big a public health problem as inactivity. And neither are most of the, many of these other things. So let's not uh, ignore other things. But let's get activity in there. And Russ and I have argued at NIH with high-level officials for some years. And I guess we're just totally dopes, because they're, they're not doing it the last last I heard. So, yes, I am getting close to the end. Are you relaxed? Oh my God, thank goodness. Um, I hope we'll get more emphasis on energy balance, you know, both sides of the equation. Let's do more research, let's understand it better. And one one point that if you, uh, if Russ calls one of you, and says, oh, it's too bad, to, I'm sorry to report that we found Steve dead at his desk today. It'll be because I read, and I can do this every week, I can find a top scientific journal with an article on obesity and health outcome X. And I look through the article, go to the find box, and physical activity, fitness, exercise are not even mentioned. Well, you do that, the next time you see an obesity article, go to the find box, if activity, fitness, section are not mentioned, then throw it away because it's junk science. It's junk science. And you do the same thing with my articles. You go to them and, and type in percent fat, BMI, et cetera. And if I don't include any of that, throw mine away too. It'll be junk science. You think I'll ever get one published? <laughs> or we know. But top journals, <laughs> it's really irritating. So we need more balance in research funding for activity and obesity, more balance in discussion, more balance out there in the public, and more balance more in science. But I do have an absolute secret here that uh, 
I, I took a picture of this in Dr. Claudio's office this morning. I am going to steal it from him. You want to stay in energy balance, you get this jelly belly machine. <laughs> and you see, you got to turn this crank to get your jelly bean. So spend some energy to get some energy. Of course, maybe you get more beans in it. But anyway, thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> I think I'm supposed to argue.